Now I must say that um, when I see when I see so many people um, come along to a lecture like this, I, 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 for a very short period at least, I think to myself, "Good God, Joe, you're quite popular." Um, <laughs> but then, unfortunately, reality takes over, and I um, I know that it's simply the nature of the, the subject. Um, gangs, you know, they're mysterious, aren't they? They seem to exist quite close to us. You know very little about them. They explode into the media from time to time um, in sensational sort of ways. And we want to just sort of look over the fence and sort of see what these groups are. But for me, and I suspect for um, a lot of you as well, when, certainly when I first started this um, project and wanted to look at them, you know, even in an elementary look at gangs, we can see that they are either very involved in or, or surrounded by these sort of bigger, more important social issues. You know, you think of um, poor uh, educational failure, perhaps, or overcrowded housing, or intergenerational poverty, unemployment. You know, all of these issues, poor health, um, drug and alcohol dependency. Gangs are somewhere in these realms, you know, and if, we, if you think about these types of um, subjects, and if, you, and if you look at the, the society as a human body, these sorts of subjects are, are the things that make society a bit ill. And so I thought, and I'm sure you've all thought, um, to some degree, consciously or otherwise, that if we can understand the gangs, we can understand much broader, bigger, more important uh, questions. And this was one of the reasons that I undertook the study I did. Another reason, of course, is because I thought I'd make a tremendous talk now what I was. Fly on the lap, I guess. Um, but I sat in a lecture theatre. Um, gee, it feels like a long time ago now. And, and I guess it was. And the lecturer said there's a dearth of research on gangs in New Zealand. And at this time, some very important laws were being passed, some very intrusive laws uh, around bugging and collecting data. I sound a little bit familiar. Um, <laughs> And I thought we shouldn't be passing laws such as this without some evidence. Um, and so it was surprising to me that there was no research on gangs, even the introduction to the bill that, that, that housed these um, series of, of laws said that there was no independent research around gangs. And so I thought I might um, attempt to, to, to correct that. And in some small part, at least, um, I hope I have. Now, with these sort of lofty um, ambitions, I guess, in mind, I, with a dreadful, dreadful mix of ignorance and arrogance, I picked up a pencil and pad and decided to hit the street, following on from traditions of some sociologists that I really admire. Um, you know, the, the sociologists from the Chicago School of Criminology that, that was established, or sociology really, that was established in that early, or the early part of the 1900s, who said that you can't understand the world by sitting in a library or in the ivory towers, you go to the laboratory of the street. And so, of course, this is what I um, endeavoured to do. Now, um, unfortunately, you find yourself, and it all, sounds all well and good, um, until you find yourself with a knife to the throat, and you start thinking to think that I prefer to stay in the, in the library. In fact, the guy that put the knife to my throat must have seen. And by the way, when you've got a knife to your throat, all element of cool vanishes. <laughs> Yeah, I've watched too many movies, I thought I was sweet. Nah, it's not like that at all. Well, with the greatest respect, I was less worried about the blood draining from my face as I wasn't squirting out my chest at that point in time. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, uh, so I, I, had, I had, and I guess, you know, you, when you do get into these situations, and by goodness, that wasn't the, um, the only one, um, you begin to wonder sort of what you're doing there really. But hopefully um, it's, it's been worth it and I guess um, I'll allow you people to be the judge of that. <coughs> now, I, um, whilst I appreciate that it's the subject matter rather than my bloody genius that brings you here, um, I get invited to do a few of these things and I've I, and whether it be in a formal sort of environment um, and but more often than not in an informal environment at dinner parties or at the pub or wherever some and I'll, I'll tell stories about what has happened or give my opinions on certain things and um, so I tend to tell I often tend to tell the same stories over 
and over again, as you might imagine. And so when you come here um, and say, oh, good, I'll get to you know, learn about the gangs, I, in my mind, I'm thinking, God damn it, I've got to listen to Jared Gilbert again. You know, it's like, oh, shit. So what I'd like to do tonight, if I can, and I hope you'll excuse the indulgence, is um, I've got a couple of things that I think are really interesting and, and really important, a couple of just, just interesting parts to look at, given we've only got um, a short period and there's only so much we can do. But I'd really like to cut that down as, as small as I can and open it up to questions because I have, I'm, I'm yet to be in a, um, a position, and I hope you don't make me a liar tonight, be in a position where questions have, have, have there have been a, a lack of questions, or more often than not there's more questions than we have time. And that <clears throat> allows two things which I think are really cool. The first is that um, that means we'll, we we'll, might go in some unexpected directions, which I enjoy. Um, and, and perhaps more importantly, it means that we will discuss what you want to talk about rather than what I think you might want to hear. So, um, I, I, yeah, with, yeah, with your grace, I think that's what we'll do. All right. Now, the couple of issues that I'm going to look at I want to focus primarily, um, at least for the part, you know, the part that I'll talk about, the questions can come from anywhere about anything. Um, I want to look at what we might call patch street gangs, which have um, traditionally or, or, or been called ethnic gangs. I don't like the term ethnic gangs, and the reason I don't like it is because we've all got an ethnicity, whether we park here or not, so I kind of think the, the people that devised that term meant ethnic minority gangs. But even if we accept that, very, very few gangs, even um, extreme skinhead um, groups, um, have often held different ethnic um, uh, ethnicities within them. And so you never get clean ethnic groups. So I prefer patch street gangs. And what I mean by that is we've got, hopefully, no, we don't. Oh, here we are. Um, that's, so, so these are the bikies, right? Outlaw motorcycle clubs. Um, outlaw, outlaw motorcycle gangs. They prefer outlaw motorcycle clubs. I don't really, I, I'm, I'm comfortable with the latter. Um, so we're not going to talk about those early on. We're going to talk about the Patch Street gangs. And by that I mean um, the largest gangs in our country, um, primarily um, dominated by the big two, which is the Black Power and the Mongrel Mob. Now, gangs are... Um, not new. And if we look, we can see that gangs, in fact, have been with us since at least um, colonial times in 1842, having been transported from uh, Parkhurst Prison in England. 128 juveniles were said to uh, have begun roaming Auckland streets and were blamed for a rapid spread of uh, moral pestilence. Um, Twenty years later, the New Zealand Herald reported that a number of boys and young men congregate together and commit outrages of a nature altogether unfit for publication. But after telling us they're unfit for publication, they then tell us what they were. Um, these outrages include breaking windows, uh, breaking windows, breaking and entering, assault and stripping females naked and dragging them about. And these lawless practices, they say, occurred at least four nights in the week on average. Uh, in a similar vein, during 1888, the weekly news railed against garden robbing. Garden robbing? Window breaking, insolent, defiant, and ferocious generation of young cubs. Um, furthermore, there were well organised, in quotes, gangs of about 10 to 20 youths reported in the 1890s with leaders and code of signals who deliberately jostled pedestrians and squirted tobacco juice at passers by while making obscene and insulting remarks. Similarly, gangs revered in the early 1900s, and these groups were believed to have developed secret languages and engaged in initiation rituals involving urine, both human and equine, being placed in new members' hats. In 1927, it was said that young gangs in Auckland were engaged in fights with knives and coshes, um, vandalism stealing, and the claiming of territory that they would defend with great viciousness. So gangs have always, well, appear, appear to have been with us for quite some time. However, however, um, the gangs as we know them have a, have, have a um, 
uh, their genesis in the 1950s. Um, but the, the, their roots are just in the 1950s. We wouldn't recognise the gangs of the 1950s as the gangs of today, but we have got a direct connection with the groups, both through outlaw clubs, actually, through, uh, and also um, through the Patch Street Gangs. But the Patch Street Gangs are connected to groups called the Bodgies, which some of us in the room, some, when I say some of us, perhaps some of you, I don't remember, but obviously I've read about the Bodgies uh, of the 1950s, who were... Um, Fairly interesting sort of groups, really, by um, by all accounts. Or, and, and, and just think at how much uh, concern and chaos these people were creating. <laughs> Dreadful, aren't they? I mean, uh, um, at the time, uh, in the 1950s, these groups were a cause of tremendous concern. The rise of the teenager, rock and roll and rebellion. And in fact, we can see... Uh, a, a direct lineage, believe it or not, a direct lineage between groups just like that and the mongrel mob. The mongrel mob initially started as uh, a bunch of Pakia men, um, perhaps not quite back uh, this far, um, who wore pea coats and purple socks. Haven't they come a long way? But the... Um, one of the greatest influences, in fact, um, whilst we can see a direct uh, correlation with, with groups just as this, one of the greatest um, uh, events that occurred in, in New Zealand gang history, fundamentally changed everything, was the Hells Angels uh, arriving in Auckland. And when I say arriving in Auckland, they established in Auckland. There was a man named Jim Kiriko um, who came to... The New Zealand, that's Jim, there with the hat on. Um, and he came to a group uh, of Milk Bar Cowboys. Now, we're just going to talk about the Milk Bar Cowboys just for a very short period because they relate directly to the Patch Street Gangs. Um, uh, he came to New Zealand and established a group of Hells Angels out of a group that was initially called the Auckland Outcasts. Um, and he is fundamentally absolutely fundamentally changed the gang scene in New Zealand. Now, quite interestingly, this, sorry, this occurred in 1960. Quite interestingly, this guy here actually is the guy I managed to track down and interview to, to, to find out about a bit about this time. But quite interestingly, the Hells Angels, I'm, I don't think there'd be a person in the room who's never heard of the Hells Angels, I'm sure. Um, they are all around the world. There are hundreds of chapters and tens of thousands of members. Um, just the fourth chapter anywhere in the world existed in Auckland, New Zealand, and the very first chapter outside of California was in Auckland, New Zealand, which seems absolutely phenomenal. But more than a quirk of history, um, although I'm saying that you probably won't get it as a trivial pursuit question, but um, what he did, what in this one act of establishing the Hells Angels here so early on in the piece, fundamentally changed everything, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain why. Obviously, it changed the Milk Bar Cowboys. Um, I call it a pivot point because it was this one instance where the entire scene just hinged. The entire scene changed. He changed all of the Milk Bar Cowboy groups, as they're called at that stage, into outlaw motorcycle clubs. But more importantly than that, for our purposes today, is that he changed the street gang scene as well. Because unlike uh, internationally, um, our street gangs have always traditionally worn patches, back patches or colours. Um, that doesn't happen anywhere else in the world. Um, there have been small instances of it occurring elsewhere, but it, but it doesn't generally. And I assume we know what, when we mean back patches, this is what we mean. So it's, these are, it's called a three-piece patch often. So you've got the top rocker and the bottom rocker, the top rocker. Now, I assume the name rocker comes from the fact that it looks like the feet of rocking chairs, I assume. Um, you've got the name of the, the group at the top, and then you've got a region down the bottom. And initially it was always a region or a city, um, but nowadays it's as likely to be simply New Zealand or Aotearoa, um, depending on the groups. Uh, and then the, the centre patch. It's like a logo. 
Now, what did this mean? The back patch is significant. Before this, there were no real common identifiers for a gang. Um, gangs were, um, if you think about the, the bodies that we saw before, they were disguised in just youth culture. A lot of youth looked exactly that way. When the back patch came, it created insider and outsider distinction. Suddenly you knew exactly who these people were. Now that had um, numerous effects, really. One, it worked as sort of a form of logo which attracted people to the groups. Um, secondly, it certainly how, sure as hell attracted the police to focus on the groups because it's so easily identifiable. So uh, no longer was it just youth culture, it was a gang issue. Uh, fundamental change. Um, and also it meant that any activity by one member was a reflection of the group. Suddenly it wasn't an individual that undertook something, it was a member of the mongrel mob or a member of the black power that undertook it. So, so, so issues, uh, individual crimes were seen as a reflection of the group. Fundamental, fundamental. And also the insider-outsider distinctions that, that Patch has created uh, meant that there was a them and us. And a them and us inevitably leads to conflict, whether it be with the police or, uh, more commonly, with other gangs. What Carrico and the Hells Angels also brought to New Zealand was a distinct hierarchical structure. Before that, groups were, I mean, we could have formed the gang. We could have been the Auckland Outcasts. It would have been great too, I know it. Um, we could have formed the Auckland Outcasts. And because, because you're the toughest of the group, you'd just be naturally become the leader. There wouldn't be a vote or there wouldn't be a formal position, just the toughest or perhaps the most charismatic or best with women or, or whatever, I'm not going to be even close, um, would, be the, would, be the, would, would be the leader. Now the problem with that um, is, uh, for, for cohesion or for longevity of the, the gang is concerned is that if um, the, this person, this, this key person to the group leaves, then it tends to collapse the gang. So what we saw in the 1950s before um, the, the arrival of the Hells Angels and the idea of the, the, these factors was that the groups would spring up and then they'd fall away. So we did, none of those groups in the 1950s, before these elements came, none of these groups survived. They would come up and they would fall away. What these factors lent themselves to is a longevity. The membership would still turn over. It was still a young person's game at this stage. It's still turning over like this. But the groups themselves could survive over time. Because what you've got with this distinct hierarchical structure, you've not only got roles, so it means that you, you know, of a president, a vice president, and at least a sergeant at arms, but often a treasurer and secretary as well. Certain roles that will, that will fulfill certain duties to ensure the gang functions pr properly. But when you've got the role of president, so now we elect you as president, or you become the president, if you leave, that position still exists. So it almost creates a vacuum that you're going to put someone into. Um, and so it just lends itself to being filled. So none of the groups that didn't take up these things, uh, hell, <laughs> let, me, let me say that again, the only groups that took up these structures and look survived, the ones that didn't, fell away. They're important, very important. Um, the other thing is we cre um, that the Hells Angels brought, and uh, just, just one thing, these distinct hierarchical structures were uniform in the outlaw motorcycle clubs, absolutely uniform. They were all the same across different clubs. The patch street gangs tended to be a little bit looser with them, the, the, and, and, and the democracy often wasn't there you were more likely to gain the presidency through violent insurrection than you were through a democratic vote, but nevertheless. And the other thing that came about is distinct rules um, that you'd have to pay fees um, to the club uh, and that you'd have a clubhouse. Now what these things are doing, what all these things are doing actually, particularly the, the distinct hierarchical structure, these rules and fees, is you're creating an entity that is distinct from the sum of the members. When we were just us in a group, we were just five people in a gang. Whereas when we've got a structure, we've got rules, we're paying fees to something else. You're not paying that fee to any single individual. You're paying it to this thing that exists outside of us. You're creating an entity. And once again, this just lends itself to being, to, to being able to survive over time. And hence why these groups did survive over time. These changes were dramatic 
absolutely dramatic. We did not have gangs that existed over time before these things came in to play. Um, and we can thank the Hells Angels for them. I've got their address if you'd like to write them a note to 21 Brentwood Ave. Um, so yeah, so that, look, the sum of this is that, and I just think it just sums it up, that the group became more than the sum of its members so it could survive membership turnover. Groups before this time did not. And could, well, I don't know if it could not, but did not. And this makes New Zealand's street gang scene unique. It makes it unique. We don't have this um, internationally. Now, there have been some groups in America they called super gangs um, that did hold these structures. And again, they, 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 they achieved longevity over time. But most gangs internationally, um, and, and you know, we're not talking about organised criminal groups here, we're talk, talking about street gangs, um, have got very loose structures and do fall over. They're very, very loose. Um, New Zealand is unique in its, its organisation. Um, you know, I'm inclined to call it um, sophistication, but I don't know if that quite sums it up, to be honest, but you know, I think you know what I mean. And so longevity was achieved. You know, they're still young. The gangs are still young at this stage. We're talking about in the 60s and 70s, or predominantly actually for the street gangs, the 70s. We're still talking about youths, but the groups themselves are surviving over time. And um, I think I can probably just squeeze this in here because it's interesting. That we look at them staying um, younger at this, this time, and I would argue that one of the reasons for that is that um, people within these groups would um, mature and, and be become a big part of that. They'd get a, you know, a job and they would fit back into mainstream society. When structural unemployment came along in the late 1970s and into the 1980s, that outlet, that, that, that avenue for exit was fundamentally closed and so we started to see the ageing of membership. But for this, at this stage at least, the gangs remained re reasonably young. Um, so those are internal, those are in the internal issues that fundamentally changed our scene. Now, actually what I probably should have said is the reason, the point I'm trying to make here, or the point I'm going to make, hopefully, um, is that I'm going to compare the rise of these groups, our traditional patched gangs, I'm going to compare them to LA-style street gangs, these new youth gangs, and to see whether or not we can see some similarities and differences. Um, so the external factors that were influencing these groups was the urban drift was massive for the, the, the street gangs. The, um, the, the, the gang scene in, in 1959, interestingly enough, two reports were written, one by Levitt and one by Green, one in Auckland and the other in Wellington. Um, quite, quite clearly shows that the gang situation, as immature as it was, was, was overwhelmingly Pakia. By uh, 1970, just over a decade later, the next um, significant report was written which shows that it was, um, the gang scene had become predominantly Maori. And one of the reasons for that, well, pr the primary reason for that was the urban drift. Not only did it um, change the demographics in the 1950s, of course, New Zealand cities tended to be predominantly Pākehā, um, but the concerns that came out of the urban drift, the fact that many Māori failed to um, um, adjust to urban life, um, and indeed that many Pākehā failed to uh, adjust to having Māori in their midst, created um, significant problems. Now I can't, I, I, I won't dwell on that point now, but the, the, one, the, the one thing I will say is this, that the fact that we got these Maori gangs at this time was utterly inevitable. The, the, um, the enormous amount of research um, that has been done on gang formation and recruitment is really clear. We know why gangs form. We absolutely know. It's got to be one of the most proven um, uh, phenomena in the social sciences, without doubt. We absolutely know it. Um, and the environment at this time with the urban drift created the social conditions whereby gang membership was an utter inevitability. Gangs don't tend to be, in fact gangs aren't, um, uh, an outcome or a, um, an anomaly of an otherwise healthy society. They tend to be the symptom of social problems that are occurring, and it just so happens the urban drift created massive social problems. Now, at the same time, um, and if you think about uh, in the late 1960s, 
we may recall it was the beginning of a very challenging time for um, New Zealand society in so much as there was this rise of protest movement, second wave of feminism were there, so women were getting into the streets, or liberals generally were getting into the streets. We were fighting against the Vietnam War, um, um, anti-apartheid um, protests, anti-nuclear protests. We're starting to go from the 1950s conservative New Zealand where nothing was challenged through to a period of everything was challenged. Rebellion um, itself became cool. Um, and I think to a certain degree this environment inevitably must have bolstered the anti-social outlook of the gangs. The gangs weren't the only one at this time calling cop, calling, oh, that was my beer. Um, that's a dreadful waste. The cops at this stage, uh, sorry, the, the gangs at the only stage weren't the only um, people calling the cops pigs. I mean, there were, you know, on university campuses with a hotbeds of protest, um, that there were, you know, violent confrontations between liberals and the, and, and the police. And this environment, I find, is um, potentially conducive to this. But more, most importantly is this idea that we'll all be aware of, of um, the hippies at this time, right? There was this idea of um, a common good. Well, the gangs exemplified that. The, uh, the clubhouse and the commune are not a million miles apart. If we look at um, the hippies, um, you know, like Tim Shadbolt or, um, you know, or again, part of the protest movement, or James K. Baxter or the like, dressing at the time was anti-consumerist. You'd walk around in bare feet and ripped jeans and you had your long hair and all this, this type of thing, which was a dramatic change for, for, for New Zealand at that time. Now, the gangs had none of the lofty ideological goals of the hippies, obviously. But, and this is the important part, this is what I want to come back to. But they dropped out of society. They didn't buy into it. They wanted to say, do you know what? Fuck you. I'm not interested. I'm going to stand outside of society. And that's exactly what they did. Now, it's a representation of that. Oh, just before I do. And so I think in this part, we've got to see them as part, and, and part of a wider social context. That the gangs formed in this specific period in New Zealand history, and it defined them. They didn't do this in isolation. They did it as part of a wider social culture. But um, ridgies, uh, people perhaps won't be familiar with the term, it's, um, it's derived from originals, which is the original clothing you're patched in. When you're patched in, the clothing you're patched in becomes sacred. And so it's never washed. It's a brilliant story. Um, I mean, you can imagine what they came like. In fact, I think I might have a photo. Yeah, look, that's, there they are. So when you, when you, um, when you had your ridges, when they, when they rotted or wore out, you either patched them, or you can kind of see this guy here. You just sewed another pair of jeans on underneath, inside them, yeah? Imagine the smell. There's a guy um, named, um, this original, one of the original Mongrel Mob members, he'd been in um, prison, I can't remember where actually, and, um, but they didn't have um, toilets at the time, flushing toilets and the like, so they had what they called piss pots. And he would take, he would always get his piss pot and throw it onto his pants because he wanted these ridges to be the most rank things in the world. And as you can imagine, they became that. Anyway, um, he went home to live with his mother, and um, his mother washed them. He, nev he never spoke to her again. How angry he was. He never spoke to his poor suffering mother again. Um, so Ridges were taken really seriously, and, and, and the reason for that um, was that it was seen to, um, you know, the, 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 the blood of your enemies on them, um, the fluid, potential sexual fluids from, from conquest is on them, um, from grease, from rides, or fixing your bike, or whatever is on them, and so you, um, you don't wash them. But more importantly for our purposes here um, is the fact that it, it's a symbol that these guys didn't want anything. They just wanted to drop out and look as rough and just set themselves apart from society. And I think this is a very fundamental point when we look at these new gangs. They want to drop, up, drop out of society. I mean, you don't dress like that if you're interested in consumerism. <laughs> yeah? Or, as it happens, probably a job in retail. Right? All right, so what's new? So let's look at these LA-style street gangs. Jesus, I'm rabbiting on, to be honest. I haven't had enough to drink. Um, so LA-style street gangs. So, and we know, I, I just think about it, I haven't got an image of those. That was a real, that was an era, a real era. 
I hope you know what I'm talking about though. They're not backpatch wearing, they tend to wear bandanas, they're young, and they, you know, if you're turned on MTV, you've probably seen one that's looking like it. Um, these groups tend to be much looser in structure and don't have the hierarchy. Um, sound familiar? A little bit like our bodgies or so of the 1950s. And so, of course, what we're getting is that they seem, they largely, largely, it's changing a little bit, tend to, to, to come up and fade away, just as exactly the same way as the gangs did in the 1950s, before we had the influence of the structure. So we've got a churn of membership, a churn of groups. Um, those with a greater structure tend to survive over time. Now, I suspect, strongly suspect that most people here would not be able to name. You'd, I reckon you'd have a pretty good shot at naming a few patch groups. I reckon most people here would name a few patch groups. I think you'd really struggle to name too many LA-style street gangs. But if I mentioned the Killer Bees, I think most people would go, oh, yeah, I've heard of the Killer Bees, yeah? Formed underneath a group called the Tribesmen, uh, an outlaw motorcycle club who know exactly the structure that works. And so these are the groups that are surviving over time. Um, and just one point quickly to make here, um, which seems a bit unrelated now, but it will make more sense um, later, um, is that they, they, these groups tend to be young. These patched gangs have created something of a generational barrier to membership. If you're a, if you're a 17 or 18 year old rebellious youth, the last thing you want to do is go and listen to music of your grandfather um, and, you know, and, 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 and hang, yeah, hang out with your dad. I mean, it's ridiculous. Um, and so the, the, the failure of rejuvenation has created barriers which have allowed these young groups to really spring up. In the 80s, they sort of they didn't exist because all the young people that were that way inclined went into the existing gangs. So they created a barrier, and hence we've got them. Now, the external factors, and this is the important part, and this is where we want to see some really interesting, I think, really interesting contrasts. They're not, you know, you know the, the ridges I said was a symbol of the, the old gangs dropping out. These gangs don't want to borrow that. They're buying in. They're buying into society. Big time buying into it. Now, what I mean by that is, if you look at um, the MTV music videos of their heroes, they are all about flash cars. They're all about big gold jewellery. They're all about the bling. Now, if, as a society, as we tend to, we tend to see the, um, the goal as material wealth, these guys want a piece of it. Absolutely want a piece of it. Um, whereas our gangs of the past didn't. Um, so they're hyper-materialists. They're, they're, they've got high, they're, they're, quite clearly, they require the, um, the consumerism, or it's more than consumerism, it's the, um, the finer and grander things of life. Now, if you're a young bloke uh, in South Auckland, I always tend to pick on South Auckland, it's not really fair, but... Um, if you're a young bloke growing up and you're striving toward having the big flash car, the numerous gold jewellery and gold watches, the, you know, the half a dozen bitches, um, then that was meant to be a joke. There wasn't, I was, someone was going to get, uh, uh, potentially I was going to get killed there by the toughest person in my gang too. <laughs> Betrayed. Um, um, uh, where was I before I started to get all sexist on it? Um, uh, so yeah, if, so if, so if you're if you're if you're uh, if you're striving for if your goal is to achieve that materialistic wealth, but you look around and go, what are the chances of me actually getting there through legitimate means? Well, realistically, next to nothing. Very very very, very you know. And so wh what's the outcome? Profit-driven crime. What are you going to turn to? Profit-driven crime. Without a doubt, this is this is not. I, I think this is is inevitable as the sun will come up tomorrow, this is going to occur. Um, so yeah, so we'll see a greater degree of profit driven crime. So what we're going to, what we've, what, this is the change from this to this. Now there are two paths here, um, neither of them lead to particularly great places in my view. Um, the firstly that these, um, that these groups will, these young LA style street gangs will invariably merge with the patched traditional gangs. And if you see them, they tend to universally wear colours that reflect the bigger groups, so the red or the black, uh, sorry, the red or the blue, blue being mongrel mob, uh, blue being black power, red being mongrel mob, or the killer bees wear yellow, which is associated with the tribes. And so it could well be that they get absorbed. And I actually favoured this a few years ago. I genuinely favoured that that would be 
the most likely outcome. And the reason I favoured that is I figured that these young guys wouldn't like it in jail. That when they went to jail, they would seek some protection and they would get that protection from the older groups and so they would merge with them and I thought that's where it would probably happen. No. The statistics out of jail are quite clearly showing that these groups are surviving in prison. Now, this I think has some... Um, interesting consequences because if these groups do in fact maintain their own identity and evolve then we've got this hyper materialism and they're younger so they've, their propensity to violence is greater then I think we've got some real issues um, in the immediate future which brings me hopefully quite quickly to a second point that I'd like to talk about and that's this idea of intimate escalation. Now, you may never have heard of that, um, because I invented the term not that long ago, which is the reason why I think it's bloody genius. <laughs> um, what it is is a theory. Now, there were, because, um, I mean, and I was actually speaking to the department earlier, actually, and um, theory isn't particularly popular uh, for many students. I must admit I always enjoyed it, but I do think that, personally, that one should get the data and form theory rather than go start with a theory and then try and shore it up with data. Seems about ass a bit face to me. But um, there are three theories that I develop in the book and I think personally I genuinely think it's an important thing to do and I'll tell you why. How good is it when you say oh, I've just got to go give a lecture, can you give me a couple of beers? I said I don't have a bottle opener and he gives you one. It's brilliant. Um, So the, the first thing to recognise is that gangs have foregone. I mean, look, if you've got to get me to do a lecture after hours, I mean, I've got a man's got to have a drink. In fact, should we have a break? Does anyone want to go get a drink? I'm pretty relaxed. Um, that gangs forego the criminal justice system. They say anything that happens to us, and this is taken to a really ridiculous extreme in, in occasions, Anything that happens to us, we will solve. It's got nothing to do with anybody else. We will solve it. Now, if you've got no redress to the criminal justice system, an inevitable consequence, of course, is violence, because how the hell else do you sort anything out? I mean, if something happens to me, I go to the cops, say, oh, you know, bloody hell, that's happened to me, uh, and they go to court, I feel a bit good that someone's been um, put in jail or fined or whatever the hell it is that's happened to me. They don't have that. They've forgotten it. So violence um, is a necessary outcome. So if, 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 if there's a grievance against them, they will go and solve that grievance through violence. Now, initially, initially these hostilities, and, and, and Christchurch is brilliant at the moment, we're in a massive state of flux. Not only are we seeing these LA-style street gangs come through, which I think is fundamentally going to change our scene, um, and potentially not in too good a ways, but if you look at Christchurch, it's always been a bellwether state, a bellwether city, um, whether we like it or not, particularly for outlaw clubs, were very, very hot, heavily populated. And probably the last 10 years, we saw just this rapid, really remarkable decline in the outlaw clubs, due, um, not in, in small part, in fact, to smokeable methamphetamine, to pee. Um, you know, people blame the gangs for the pee. I think the, um, the pee has done much, much more damage to the gangs then they've um, profited from it. I tell you that for free. And in fact, um, one police officer said to me, um, quite tellingly, that if he could have taken credit for introducing P into the gang scene, he absolutely would have, because it's done more damage to the gangs than the cops have ever been able to do. But, um, but see, in Christchurch, the, 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 the old gangs have really um, fallen away quite um, substantially. And, and, and now we're seeing these new groups come in. We've got the rebels come in. They've gained quite a um, significant toll, getting reasonably large. There's uh, some rumours, and uh, uh, let's just call them rumours, um, of the headhunters coming in. There's some rumours, and again, we'll just call those rumours. Oh, the, this is in the paper. These rumours are in the paper, so we'll take that. Oh, I just don't want to be seen to be saying anything. Is that um, the banditos are coming? So we've got these new groups coming to town. Now, when new groups come to town, so they don't, they don't, they don't belong to, it tends to create um, conflict. Now, this conflict is stirred up simply because, say for example, just for example, and I swear to God this is just a hypothetical, the rebels are in town now, the banditos are rumoured to be coming in. 
um, in Australia, the banditos and the rebels are significant enemies. Now, here, they've got nothing to do with it. Nothing to do with those conflicts whatsoever. They're not Australians, they're Kiwis. So the conflict um, uh, or, or the animosity is purely theoretical. It's purely an abstract concept that we're a little bit better than them and you know they think they're better than us or they don't know bullshit. And you know, this is how these sort of conflicts um, tend to start. Not on anything but um, you know, ethereal just ideas of, of superiority, perhaps. But what happens is that these lead to initial fights or brawls. And what these initial fights and brawls garner is genuine grievance because suddenly my bike's been damaged or my mate's been stabbed or I've been stabbed or my mate's been killed or they've thrown a firebomb somewhere and suddenly there are genuine grievances that you feel personally, intimately aggrieved about. Now what happens there, of course, is that suddenly the whole situation escalates. Suddenly you, you are personally involved that they are actually not just, a, there's not just a sort of um, concept of an enemy, there's a genuine enemy who's done me damage. And so you go after it. Now, not only does that mean that the violence is likely to escalate, but it does so in, um, in, in dangerous ways. Because once you've got a personal involvement, it tends to cloud rationality. You tend to be, if, when you're emotionally involved like that, it tends to everything, you know, you get that white noise and you just go. And this is how gang conflicts create gang wars, according at least to this genius theory of intimate escalation. Now, um, why is this um, important? Um, you know, given that, you know, we might have a, be a bit suspect on theory or we're not really that interested or, or it's just, you know, it's just maybe just an interesting way of looking at it. I think there's more to it than that. I think we should be able to use these theories to um, provide action points. Oh, hang on. What have I got here? Yeah, there we go. Um, we can use these to control conflict. We've all got in society uh, 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 or in our neighbourhoods or our cities a reason to want to control conflict if it's starting to get out of hand. I mean, you may recall perhaps the last big battle that we had here uh, in Christchurch would have been in 1996 when the road knights and the Epitaph Riders were going to war and they fired shots on Rickerton Road or Addington. There were two different instances where they fired shots, and a woman got shot in the chest. An innocent bystander got shot in the chest. We've all got reasons to not want gangs to go to war. Um, so we, there's a need um, to intervene. Now, if we understand that, um, that, that conflicts escalate when we've got this idea of escalation when there's a personal hostility, as soon as we know that's occurred, there's a way to get in there and say, hey, how do we, how do we, how do we solve this problem? And obviously, if it's about stopping its escalation and it's about um, personal grievances, then how do we make amends for the damage that's already been done? Because if a person can feel that something has been done to solve it, the chances are they won't go for Utu themselves. The second reason I think it's important is that undeniably, and this is a really really big point for law enforcement, that undeniably uh, uh, conflict within the gang scene leads to cohesion within the gang scene. When you've got periods of war, whether that be in fact against the police, of certain operations when the police are just hammering them, or um, uh, uh, inter-gang um, warfare, the weak, yep, they might leave, and they often do. They'll just disappear. But the ones that stay are hardened by it, genuinely hardened by it. And this has a perpetuating effect because um, only the tough ones stay, and they will only recruit equally tough ones. So it starts to ratchet it up. Now, the other reason why intervention might not necessarily be a bad idea is that gang war, like war generally, and I don't use the term um, mildly, you can have conflicts. You can have certain conflicts and, and gang fights and things like that. Wars are ongoing, um, intense periods of hostility. Um, no one likes war. Really uncomfortable period. You're always looking over your shoulder. There's this beautiful moment. Um, it was terrible, really, when you, when you look back on it. I found this old video of 
I found this old video of a guy who belonged to a group called the... Um, Uh, they were in Dunedin called the... Oh, God. They got taken over by the Devil's Henchmen. I've completely... No, it wasn't the Southern Vikings. They broke up um, the British Motorcycle Club. One became the Road Knights, now they became the... Doesn't... The Damned. The Damned. Sorry, it didn't matter to anyone but me, that. <laughs> um, and I found this um, video from the 80s um, of, of news, old news footage where, in a very rare example of, um, of, a, uh, of a gang member speaking to the media, and he said, you know, this war is tough. He said, you know, wherever I, I can't get on my bike anymore and just go for a ride like I used to, you know, I'd quite like it to go back to how it was. And he says, I don't know where it's going to end. Well, it ended for him when an axle came flying through the top of his car, thrown by an opposition gang and ripped out his throat. Now, it's a terrible, terrible irony, if indeed I've used that term correctly. Um, so, uh, so, so, so the only point there to make is um, that there are opportunities to solve these conflicts. That there are that, that that oftentimes the gangs will actually they won't say it, of course, but there are opportunities to be engaged, and they may kind of quietly thank, yeah, for for trying to solve the issue. Um, and just finally, and I'm I'm going to open it up to questions just after this, actually is that we need to devise policies around this before problems occur. In this country, we have been, have a terrible tradition, um, and I think perhaps everywhere, that um, politicians have created laws, um, not to put too fine a point on it, um, for electoral advantage and electoral advantage only. We have um, had, we have been terribly, terribly poorly served by elected officials when it comes to gang legislation. Hence why, of course, we have a um, litany of failure when it comes to gang law. We've been suckered time and time and time again by politicians who will stand up and say, I can solve this with a really easy solution. Well, really easy solutions uh, complex phenomena will always deny easy solutions, and yet we take it every time. We take it every bloody time. Frustrating, you've got no idea. Um, and what's more, even when they're aware of it, they do it. I mean, you get idiots like Michael Laws, of course, who, you know, I mean, that's just what he does, and that's fine, that's okay. I mean, the guy's making talkback radio, he's not making good policy. Admittedly, the people of Wanganui have elected him twice. I mean, yeah, mind you, Americans elected George Bush twice, so it happens. <laughs> but, but, but you get others, um, and can I name them? Let's. Yeah, bugger it. Um, and because I give them credit for the first half of it, can I name them? And actually, I won't, because I don't think it's probably fair. Oh, yeah, let's name them. Um, Chester Burroughs, who put through the... Um, sorry, Chester, I just realised this is being recorded. Um, <laughs> Chester Burroughs came down... Um, and I give them all credit for this, actually. Uh, when the Whanganui patch ban was first going through, I don't know if people recall, they tried to ban patches in the city of Whanganui. Michael Laws, a wonderful Michael Laws idea, bloody brilliant stuff. I mean, and before I just go here, just let me say how ridiculous that, that this... Because it sounds good, doesn't it? Ban the patches, and it is going to annoy gangs. I mean, it's definitely going to do that. So that's cool, you know, good, right? Let's annoy some gangs. Um, a little bit like annoying Russia during the Cold War, probably, but nevertheless, well, well, but, well, but you know, we we'll annoy the gangs. But that's all it's going to do. That is all it's going to do. You think about policing. When um, if Al Qaeda wore back patches, we'd be sweet, you know. I mean, if uh, extremists wore back patches, yet we want to take them off. The problem we've got with the LA-style street gangs is they merge with wider culture. We don't actually know who they are. I mean, if our gangs want to, if our crooks, um, and, and, and according to the police, they're the worst crooks that we have. I mean, I dispute that, actually. But um, if they want to put patches on their backs, God help them. You know, God bless them. Why not? Um, yet we want to take them off for no other reason um, than it's going to annoy them. Now, if you think about all of the gang problems that exist in America without back patches, there's violence, there's intimidation, there's every issue that we've got times 10, it happens without gang insignia. To take gang insignia 
away is going to solve absolutely nothing. It's just, yeah, it's, it's great talkback radio, it's piss poor public policy. But anyway, Chester Burroughs came down, sorry Chester, came down and um, said, you know, this, this, you know, Laws has put this to me, I'm the local MP, so I feel a bit obliged to do it. And I said, well, okay, well, mate, let's just look at it logically and rationally. And we sort of went through it. And he goes, yeah, you know what, I kind of agree, but still my local area, I kind of got to do it. So he just sort of went um, and did it. So I, just, I definitely give him 10 points for coming down and trying to talk through the issues, uh, I take nine and a half of them away for then trying to push it through Parliament, which he did successfully, which, by the way, was overturned um, by the High Court at a cost to the taxpayers and, more importantly, the ratepayers of Wanganui of tens of hundreds of thousands of dollars. We are poorly served by politicians in this area. Sorry, Chester. Um, and with that, in fact, to be honest, what a great way to leave it. We are terribly served by politicians. Bugger about the gang issue, just generally. <laughs> Fuck them all, I don't like you. Um, excuse me, and please... Well, I can't say excuse my language, because if you apologise for swearing, it means you're going to try not to do it again. Um, I will now open it up. I, I do hope that was... Um, I do hope that was um, in some way useful. It's just a couple of small issues that we look at. To, and, and, and if nothing else, I think it probably shows the complexity, or I hope it shows the complexity of this issue, that we've, we've broached two very small parts of what is um, a fundamentally extremely large issue. Um, and I think we can find complexity in, 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 in all of it. But um, thank you so much. And I'll